8 Creepiest Unsolved Mysteries from Idaho, United States Thousands of cold cases per year gather dust across the U.S., but advancing technology continues to make strides in tackling formerly unsolvable cases. Here are just a few of Idaho's unsolved mysteries from across the state. Number 8. William L. Toomey. In December 1982, a man wandered into the Sacred Heart Catholic Church in Boise. Middle-aged and suntanned, he appeared to wait in line for the confessional. But he never made it into the booth. In fact, by the time the man's turn came around, he was dead on the floor. Authorities concluded that the gentleman had swallowed a cyanide capsule, although it couldn't be determined whether the act was intentional or forced. In his pocket was a large sum of cash, with a note stating that the funds be used for his funeral. The note was signed William L. Toomey, which is a company that manufactures and sells priest garb. But here's where it gets interesting, the year prior to Toomey's death, two priests in Arizona were found dead, with a wrongfully convicted suspect held at fault. Since Toomey was found wearing a belt buckle that traced back to Arizona, it is highly likely that Toomey in fact was the murderer of both Arizona holy men. That being said, many questions still remain about the circumstances of Toomey's own demise. Was his death a suicide, or retaliation? Was he about to confess to his crimes, or commit a third? Many speculated the former, and that Toomey simply miscalculated how long the cyanide would take to act. But perhaps the biggest mystery of all is simply, what was his real name? Number 7. Donald Smith. On May 11, 1987, Don Smith left his home in Hemet, California and planned on heading to Idaho to visit his daughter, Brenda Walker, whom he was recently reunited with. The two had been separated after he and Brenda's mother divorced. He started his trip alone with just his two dogs, but the next day, he arrived at the hospital where Brenda worked with an unidentified man. The man talked to Brenda's supervisor, who told him that she was on a fishing trip. After their trip, Brenda and her friends went to a local bar, and Don and his male companion arrived at the same bar soon afterwards. Don, who was an alcoholic, soon became belligerent, and Brenda and her friends left. Brenda never saw her father again. Two weeks later, in the desert outside of Twin Falls, Idaho, a couple found the body of a man. The man carried no identification, and the cause of death was determined to be two blows to the back of his head. It wouldn't be until police heard about an incident that had occurred the day prior that the man would be identified. 700 miles away in Denver, Colorado, on May 16, 1987, two vehicles collided at an intersection, and the man inside the pickup truck fled the scene. Police found a motel key in the truck and traced it to a motel room which had been registered to a man named Larry Munro. Clothes inside the motel room were covered with blood. The truck that Larry Munro was driving was, in fact, Donald Smith's vehicle, which, along with fingerprints, led to the identification of the man found in Twin Falls as Don Smith. On the day Don left home, he ran into trouble with the trailer that he had been towing, and left it with a local man in Las Vegas. Police theorized that Don picked up the hitchhiker soon after leaving Las Vegas, and they later determined that Don had called his sister two days later for money. She later gave the money to Don and the unidentified man, and police theorized that the man may have killed Don for the money. They believe that while Don let his dogs out, the man came from behind and killed him with a jack handle, which was later found in Don's truck. He then drove to Denver where the car collision occurred. The man has never been identified and Don's case remains unsolved. Number 6. Darwin Kenneth Vest. Vest was last seen in Idaho Falls, Idaho during the early morning hours of June 2, 1999. He played a weekly trivia game at the Frosty Gator with friends, then walked to the Golden Crown Lounge on Shoop Avenue for a nightcap. Vest disappeared while walking back to the residence he shared with his mother. It was raining that night but he declined a taxi ride. Vest has never been heard from again. Vest is a toxicologist and an expert on spider, snake and plant poisons, he also named the hobo spider with his sister. 
He owned Eagle Rock Research in Idaho Falls in 1999, and also worked as a projectionist for Micro Movie House. He has no formal degree, but was self-taught in st. Vest often testified about spider bites in court and occasionally worked with the FBI and the CIA. He had also appeared on the Discovery Channel. His sister told authorities a company was interested in purchasing a hobo spider trap kit Vest invented shortly before he vanished. The deal was reportedly quite lucrative, but it is not known if it was connected to Vest's disappearance. Vest's family has said it is very uncharacteristic of him to leave without calling any of his loved ones. Investigators said that Vest had been drinking the night of his disappearance. He does not hold his liquor well and may have been intoxicated when he was last seen. Authorities theorize he may have stumbled into the Snake River while walking home. Vest's family members dispute that theory, saying that he was not a heavy drinker and the river was not along his usual route home. A witness reported seeing a body floating in the river the morning after Vest disappeared, but authorities were unable to locate the remains, if there were any. Investigators admitted that the Snake River was never thoroughly searched. Other relatives believe that an unidentified man seen at the bar with Vest prior to his disappearance was involved in his case. Authorities said that they located the individual and questioned him, but he is not a suspect. Authorities do not believe that Vest chose to leave of his own accord or committed suicide. They said that their investigation led through eastern Idaho and into Utah, but did not provide specific details. There has been speculation that Vest chose to leave of his own accord and moved to Mexico, but no evidence has been located to support the theory. Vest's case remains unsolved. His family and friends held a memorial service for him on June 3, 2000, the first anniversary of his disappearance, and he was declared legally dead in March 2004. Number 5. Richard Ray Barnett. Richard was visiting his paternal grandparents' home on August 31, 1982. They lived on Hillcrest Farms, an egg and dairy farm in the Grangeville, Idaho area. The farm was seven miles north of Grangeville and encompassed several hundred acres. Richard had been staying there for a couple of weeks with his father, his mother was in southern Idaho. Richard was last seen sitting in a hay wagon in front of one of the chicken barns while dozens of workers were unloading a delivery of chickens. He has never been heard from again. His family started searching for him only 15 minutes later, but no one found any clues as to his whereabouts and called the police at 10.30 a.m. Bloodhounds tracked his scent to a fence line on the northwest part of the farm, then lost the trail. An extensive four-day search of the farm, involving 250 volunteers, turned up no sign of the child. Richard's grandparents, Waldo and Martha McCord, were suspects in his disappearance for almost two decades afterward. Martha reportedly acted oddly and although she took a polygraph exam, the results were inconclusive. She and her husband disliked Richard's mother and had wanted someone else to raise him, and it was theorized the child's grandparents secretly placed him in an underground adoption ring. Martha took another polygraph in May 2001, passed, and was cleared of an involvement in her grandson's case. Waldo also agreed to take a polygraph, but he died before the exam could take place. Another theory is that one of the temporary workers at the farm was involved in Richard's disappearance, but police could find no evidence to implicate any of them. Richard's parents live in Oregon and his mother has been active in the search for him. His disappearance remains unsolved. Number 4. Stephanie Lynn Crane. Stephanie's mother gave her money for a snack and dropped her off at the Shally Bowling Alley in Shally. Idaho on October 11, 1993. She went bowling with friends, then departed. She was last seen walking on Highway 93 toward Shally High School at approximately 6 p.m. that evening. The school was across the street from the bowling alley. Accounts differ as to whether Stephanie was going to the high school for soccer practice, or whether she was heading for her family's residence, about 500 yards away. She has never been heard from again. When 9 o'clock passed and she hadn't come home, her parents notified the police. An extensive search covering 7,000 square miles in two counties turned up no sign of her. 
A yellow pickup truck with red pinstripes was seen in the area around the time she vanished, and may be connected to her disappearance. Keith Glenn Mark Hescock has been investigated for possible involvement in Stephanie's case, and also the case of Amber Chanel Hoops. Hescock kidnapped a 14-year-old girl from outside her home in the early morning hours of June 5, 2002. He had known her family. The girl was able to escape that afternoon when he went to work, leaving her chained to a bed in his home. When the police attempted to arrest him, Hescock fled in his vehicle and lead them on a 40-mile high-speed chase, which ended at a dead-end road in the Big Hole Mountains. There he shot and killed a police dog, shot and wounded an officer, and then committed suicide. Hescock had previously worked for Hoops' grandparents, and his neighbor says he was hunting in Shally, Idaho the weekend Stephanie disappeared from that location. He also owned a yellow pickup truck similar to the one that may be connected to Stephanie's case. Authorities have not been able to link him to either disappearance, however. His only criminal record in Idaho had been for poaching, but he had felony convictions in other states. Stephanie's case remains unsolved. She has three younger sisters and is described as a tomboy who was part of the youth bowling league and enjoyed going hunting with her father. Her parents divorced in mid-1994 and both of them are now deceased. Her mother died in 1997 and her father in 2012. Authorities have five to ten persons of interest in her case, none of whom are family members. They believe she was taken against her will by a stranger. Number 3. Will Hendrick. 25-year-old Will Hendrick was a well-liked theater student at the University of Idaho. He had a good job on campus and recently landed a small part in a Hollywood action film. He lived with his partner of five years, Jerry Schutz. On January 9, 1999, the two were remodeling their kitchen when Will mentioned going to their friend Katie Payne's party. However, Jerry was tired and did not want to go. At around midnight, Will said goodbye to Jerry and left for the party. By the time Will arrived, there were two parties going on. One party, on the third floor consisted of former athletes from the town high school. The other party, on the second floor, consisted of Katie's friends from the college theater department. Throughout the night, Will was worried about their friend Karen. She was having problems with her boyfriend, one of the attendants of the third floor party. He tried to protect Karen from her boyfriend, but Katie did not want him to get involved. By 2.30 a.m., Karen had left the party, leaving Katie to watch over Will, who was drunk. She went inside briefly to call Karen and make sure she got home. When she came back outside, Will was gone. She noticed that his car was still parked out front, so she assumed that he had gone upstairs. The next morning, however, the car was gone. Witnesses at the party reported hearing a car, possibly Will's, drive away at a high rate of speed. At around 11 a.m., Jerry called Katie and asked if Will was there. When he learned that he was not there, Jerry began calling other theater students. However, no one knew where he was. Will's parents were contacted and were also concerned for him. When he did not turn up by Monday morning, 36 hours later, his friends searched the city for him. Later that day, they found Will's car, parked on a downtown seat. Jerry was surprised to find that it was unlocked and that Will had left his portfolio in the back seat. Police found no blood or hair samples in the car. There was also no apparent evidence of foul play. Police questioned a man who reported Will entering his apartment, below Katie's, drunk and belligerent. The man was able to calm him down and get him out of his apartment. He was ruled out as a suspect and is believed to be the last person to see Will alive. Investigators have looked into hundreds of leads and checked out several possible sightings of Will. However, they still have no idea what happened to him. On September 7, 2002, two hunters found Will's skull and jaw bone dumped in a rural area near Moscow, Idaho. No other remains are found. The cause of death could not be determined, but the manner of death was ruled a homicide. However, there are several possible suspects in the case. Will's mother, Leslie, 
claimed that her nephew's foster brother had told her about three men who had bragged about killing Will. She recognized them all as individuals she had dealt with while working as a police officer. She fears that the men may have killed Will because he was her son. However, the police have not confirmed or denied this theory. Another prime suspect is the truck driver that Jerry fired shortly before Will's disappearance. According to police, the truck driver actually lived in the same trailer park as Will and Jerry. Will actually knew the man and sometimes stayed at his home. The day after Will vanished, the man suddenly packed up his belongings and left for Florida. He also refused to cooperate with police. However, he was never charged in the case. Will's case still remains unsolved. Number 2. Amber Shawnell Hoops. Hoops resided with her grandparents, Norris and Kathleen Bergener, in the 2700 block of East Lincoln Road in Idaho Falls, Idaho. She was last seen on September 14, 2001. That evening she spoke on the phone with her sister until 10 p.m. Her grandparents went to bed at 10.30, at that time, Hoops was in her bedroom. Kathleen woke up at approximately 1 a.m. and noticed that although Hoops's television set and lights were turned on, she was not in her room. The back door was unlocked. Kathleen woke up Norris at this time and they looked for her together, but couldn't find her and called the police. She has never been heard from again. Hoops's grandparents owned Bergener's classic truck and auto body shop, which adjoined their residence and Hoops occasionally used the business's computer to email her friends. She used it on the night she went missing, and after her disappearance was discovered, the computer monitor was found turned on. There was no sign of Hoops in the area, however. One of the shop's pickup trucks vanished from their parking lot on the night she went missing. The vehicle was discovered abandoned in a nearby parking lot shortly afterwards. The keys were in the ignition but there was no additional evidence at the scene. An image of one of the shop's trucks is posted below this case summary. It's unclear whether any of the shop's vehicles were connected to Hoops's disappearance. Keith Glenn Mark Hescock has been investigated for possible involvement in Hoops's case, and also the 1993 disappearance of Stephanie Crane. Hescock kidnapped a 14-year-old girl from outside her home in the early morning hours of June 5, 2002. He had known her family. The girl was able to escape that afternoon when he went to work, leaving her chained to a bed in his home. When the police attempted to arrest him, Hescock fled in his vehicle and led them on a 40-mile high-speed chase, which ended at a dead-end road in the Big Hole Mountains. There he shot and killed a police dog, shot and wounded an officer, and then committed suicide. Hescock was a friend of one of Hoops' relatives and had previously worked for at the Bergener's auto shop, but he quit his job about two years before Hoops disappeared. Her grandparents claim he had a vendetta against them and had threatened Norris shortly before Hoops went missing, and when she vanished they immediately believed he was involved. The police investigated him at the time, but he had an alibi and the authorities didn't consider him as a serious suspect until after his death in 2002. Hescock's neighbor says he was hunting in Shally, Idaho the weekend Stephanie disappeared from that location. He also owned a yellow pickup truck similar to the one that may be connected to Stephanie's case. Authorities have not been able to link him to either disappearance, however. His only criminal record in Idaho had been for poaching, but he had felony convictions in other states. Hoops left all of her personal belongings behind at her residence, including her paycheck, her relatives described her as a socially withdrawn young woman who had few friends but was very close to her family, particularly her younger sister. She was a regular churchgoer at the time of her disappearance, and her hobbies included creative writing, photography, piano playing and singing. Following her high school graduation, Hoops took a job as a nanny for two children. She was considering enrolling in culinary school. It's highly uncharacteristic of her to leave without warning. In 2007, in remembrance of Hoops, September 14th was officially designated as Idaho Falls's Missing Persons Day. Authorities believe that she was abducted from her home. Her case remains unsolved. Number 1. Diane Marie Schultz. Diane was last seen at her home on Delaware Avenue in Nampa, 
Idaho on the morning of March 25, 1977. The previous day, she and Fred, her husband of two years, had gone to the library and checked out a book. Fred asked Diane if she wanted to go for a walk afterwards, but she declined and said she didn't feel well, so they went home. The next morning, Diane still didn't feel well. Fred went to work at 7.20 a.m. when he returned, his wife was gone. There were no indications of a struggle or forced entry to the home. The car was still parked at the residence and there was mail in the mailbox and a UPS package on the porch. All of Diane's belongings, including her purse and money, were left behind at home. Diane's three cats were locked in the spare bedroom, which is where she normally left them whenever she went out, but she left her wedding ring and watch on top of a desk, which is where she kept them when she was at home or only going out for a few minutes. Diane has never been heard from again. She has no history of dropping out of sight and she is described here as an extremely reserved woman who had no friends in the area, didn't associate with the neighbors and rarely left the house. She enjoyed reading, macrame projects and spending time with her pet cats. She was estranged from her parents and the only person she was close to besides her husband was her grandmother, who lived in Flint, Michigan, they kept in touch by phone. According to the Schultz neighbors, Diane and Fred were devoted to each other and had no history of domestic arguments. Diane's grandmother stated she was highly upset and emotional during their last conversation, possibly because her parents were coming to visit later that year. Diane didn't want to see them and had asked Fred to persuade them to cancel the trip. However, Fred stated his wife was in an unusually good mood just prior to her disappearance. On April 1st, a week after Diane vanished, Police asked Fred to take a polygraph test about his wife's disappearance and he agreed. The test was scheduled for the following week, but on April 3, Fred's body was found inside his wife's stark blue 1975 Buick. Fred had been driving northbound on Highway 95 at a higher rate of speed when he shot himself in the head, and the car ran off the road and down an embankment. He left behind two suicide notes. The first was a will. The second stated Diane gave my life meaning and purpose and was everything I ever wanted and needed in a woman, and that he had given up hope that she would return home alive and he couldn't live without her. Neither of the notes indicated that Fred knew what had happened to her. Police have not named Fred as a suspect in his wife's disappearance, but foul play is suspected in her case. It remains unsolved. If you enjoy video, please subscribe my channel. Thank for watching.